the sentence of Stuart Brand, which is an architect, British architect, who inspires me a lot. So buildings are, every building is a prediction and every prediction is wrong. <laughs> nice. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. We are post G20 and we are officially kicking ass. Yeah, I think the reviews are good. It's like a movie which came out over the weekend and everyone's like, wow, what an achievement. And, you know, I'm not going to piss on anyone's parade or summit or conference. But I'm interested to know, you know, when we think of um, the future of our country, and I've spoken to a couple of people about this in different contexts, you know, about the cultural future, about the economic future, and those episodes will be coming out here uh, shortly for your listening pleasure. But um, the reason I speak to people about the future of India is because there's a lot of speculation about India sitting on the cusp of something huge, but it can go in either direction. It could either um, end up being something that we can hold on to or something that we can learn from and be uh, considerably a force to reckon with. Uh, for various reasons, right? The, the the population, the youth, the education, the the multilingual capability of our population, the multi, um, the, the diversity. But again, you know, keep, we keep uh, hearing the antagonists talking about Hindutva, talking about national pride or national nationalism being on the rise, and the various things. That's a debate for another day. But you know, just strictly from something like this, where there are, of course, two groups, there are two schools of thought, there are two parties, there are two camps that are rivals, and that are keep going on against each other. But simply speaking, I, you know, when when we look at our population, 70%, if you want to say are still living in poverty, but there's a 30% that is on the rise with economic power, with spending power, with exposure to the world, and with also confidence to do what they want, and with so many different things. I just wonder when um, summits like this attract so many, uh, so, so much attention to India, and as a result, maybe positive attention, investment. Um, what does it hold in store um, when that many people, 30% of India, still more than the US population, if I'm not mistaken? And when we start living like a, a Western lifestyle, which is quote unquote seen as successful or a better way of living. If we kind of copy that and we apply that to the Indian context, do we have enough to go around uh, when it comes to food or when it comes to land or when it comes to buildings or when it comes to homes? Just the basic things, right? Everyone wants to upgrade more cars, more places to live. I mean, better places to live, more investment, more homes to have. And someone would say, yeah, you know, there's enough for everyone and you shouldn't have the scarcity mindset, which of course I don't have. But it's it's just sometimes when you look around, you're like, fuck, where's the space for so, so many people, right? Um, and that might be seen as, oh, someone being insecure about their place being taken away. And absolutely not. But I just sometimes find it fascinating with more wealth comes more greed. And with more greed comes more opportunistic people who are trying to cheat people. And you see that happening every day. You hear stories of people being, um, you know, of, of, of family feuds over land, or you have people killing to, to kind of steal, um, you have people kind of, you know, breaking in and doing all sorts of crazy things. And this is happening in every major city across the world, I know. But more and more, it feels like it's happening when these, uh, the perception of wealth goes up, or the perception of disparity, or there is disparity, but the perception that I don't have enough compared to the person next to me goes up. So I, I don't know if it's an observation or a thought, but I'm just like, where does this take us, right? Because it feels like the idealistic thing to say is that, you know, the, a richer country brings up the whole population, but clearly not. It seems like the there is a stronger middle class, which is great. There is a extremely rich, small percentage in our country, but it seems like there is a lot more, um, uh, I wouldn't say a lot more poverty. There's existing poverty, but the poverty that is aware of how much wealth there is out there, if that makes any sense. So people are aware that this thing costs this much, there is so much out there. And that I don't know what it does to the mind because or to a person's uh, situation, do they get more desperate? Do they get inspired to work harder? Because fuck it, inspiration is great, but it not when you're not, not able to feed your family every day, I don't think inspiration is the solution, right? Because you, you you see these things, and that was coming to a point. Like when you hear when you hear of progress, you hear of mega stores coming to 
to to India, right? Like IKEA has come to where I live in Bangalore, and a lot of people just flock into IKEA. You have Walmart, or you have these massive stores. I'm not saying they're signs of wealth, but they're signs that these guys smell blood. They they smell the fact that this market is potentially going to give them huge returns, and you, that's when everyone kind of jumps into the party, right? Like land sharks. You have the real estate guys. You have the thing, and that's maybe where my problem is. It's not that people are getting richer. Let them let people get wealthier, and I think that's brilliant. I think it's these huge creation, these corporations that come in to an economy which is sensing flourishing, right? Like it happens in some places in Africa, they smell it, they smell blood. So you have then the, these big players who come and under the guise of progress and say we're giving back to the people, they kind of steal and they kind of manipulate the mindset of a person making them feel that, you know what, I've got the best thing. I've got Ikea furniture. I've got this house by this builder. I've got this car by this person. And it's, I get it, individual choice, but when there is a narrative being sold to the public that by having these certain list of things, you are perceivably at a higher status in society, then is that really individual choice or is that a choice being enforced by a few corporations? But it comes with anything with food, where to eat, where to stay, what to drive, what to, where to live, the address, the, the kind of house, the kind of schools you send your kids to so various things and i don't know this is just again thinking out loud as i do on this podcast and if you are someone who's heard it before you're like man this guy's as confused as ever and i am and i think being confused is absolutely fine because you're asking questions and i think asking questions will eventually either draw the right answer or it will take you to the right person who might have the right answer or to the certain or to a certain group who you can discuss it with then well Anyway, let me talk about today's guest. There's a reason why I mentioned IKEA especially. Um, my guest today is Jan Berlin. He is the he's a curator of design, architecture, and contemporary art, and he's the founder and former director of Z33, House for Contemporary Art in Belgium. Now, Jan and I today talk about well, architecture to start with, uh, because you know. There is so much architectural wealth when we look in the history books, right? I'm sure when you were studying, you're like, oh, look at the gold Gumbas, look at the Taj Mahal. We have to be proud of these architectural achievements of, civiliz of civilization. Now, of course, there is a lot of change since the Taj Mahal was built. We don't chop off the hands of the builders today. Uh, the, the, the laborers are still treated badly, but hands are still in place. They just have to play in the sand pit. Um, now, of course, materials have changed, technology has changed. But when we hear of architecture, buildings, I mean, I can feel it in my home in summer, if you don't put the fan or the air conditioning on, it's boiling. Now, is that because temperature has changed or because we are kind of adopting architectural practices that aren't suitable to the climate that we live in? Now, when I lived in the old house, um, which my granddad built in 19, the 1960s, you could just leave the windows open and sleep. I'm not saying you didn't need the fan. It would be nice to have the fan. But there were situations where you didn't have air conditioning. You didn't have electricity sometimes because they would have these blackouts because of lack of power. So you'd have to sleep on the ground, but you would manage. I can't imagine sleeping in this house without the fan or the air conditioning. Right? And if you leave the window open, there's a fear of being robbed. So there's so many things that have changed yet remain the same. There are fears um, and there are also um, greater desires when it comes to building your dream home. So I speak to Jan about how architecture has changed, how can it adapt with changing climate, how can we um, look at building homes that aren't just for show, that aren't just aren't just for status, that you can show to people saying, this is the home, my achievement, my, my pinnacle in my career, but a home that you can actually live in entirely. Uh, he explains what that means, a place where you can relax, a place where you can work, a place where you can eat a place where you can sleep and all these things are essential when it comes to your home but it seems that we only look at what is expected from our home which is the kitchen that we can show off or the drawing room that can hang paintings and maybe these are essential but there's a lot more to it and we talk about other things like design why aren't we respecting craftsmen why aren't we looking at designers giving them complete free reign of designing what they want to as opposed to what we want them to and how players like Ikea and huge stores like this that are making design cheap, making products cheap, making them, I would say accessible, maybe a good thing or a bad thing, but how these particular stores, uh, the mass production of these things isn't really healthy for a free design future 
and even these huge builders building mass homes, taking glass facades from New York and putting it in Delhi, aren't really the solution for a fuck sustainable future, but even a a future where we can be living in these buildings as. Um, working in these offices, which had now have circulated air, which are just these huge land, these huge free flowing plans, open plans that, oh, you know, Facebook in California did it. We're going to do it in Hyderabad. Like, is that what we need? Do we need maybe smaller offices where people have privacy? So a lot of questions, a lot of answers and a fun discussion about design, about art, about trade, about craft, about architecture with Jan Bolin. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Jan, if you're listening, thanks for being on the podcast. And for all of you listening, I appreciate it as always. Till next episode, goodbye. God bless. Take care of yourself. Cheers. Jan, it's lovely to have you on the podcast. Thank you for joining me. It's my pleasure. I'm extremely curious to find out your view on a lot of things with the background you have and the years of experience you have in design and architecture but you know i want to just start with understanding you know when i read books i'm i listen to a lot of audio books about historical uh sites and uh, a lot of the features that uh, were represented in these books right like you look at the Colosseum, you look at the acropolis you look at all these big and great monuments which are sort of a mark of human achievement when it comes to architectural uh, architecture and architectural representation. And culturally, a lot of times we look at buildings and we look at the design element of that time as significant in pr- when, it com- when it comes to progress of that society. So when it comes to that, what can we look at with today's architecture and the approach to design and the approach to architecture and make of our society and, th- well, the culture and the times we live in at large? Um, what can we learn from that? Uh, what can we learn is that uh, one one very simple fact, uh, and that's not formal, or that is uh, in the end it's formal, uh, is that um, all these uh, civilizations were mainly using the materials that were around. Um, they didn't ship materials from China to India from India to United States and from the States back to Europe and then and in the end it got discarded in Africa. Mm -hmm. So what you see is that these civilizations also because they didn't have the means of course um, were making buildings that were locally um, sourced and uh, with that uh, they built uh, whole cities uh, enormous uh, buildings uh, that we know till today so that is um, what i find uh, uh, what we can learn from that and uh, what you also see is that these um, structures um, uh, were able to that over time uh, they are still there because they were used in different, um, they had different functional place. Uh, maybe the place of worship uh, changed, but uh, the, uh, the, 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 um, uh, or the, the religion changed. That's what I wanted to say. But mm-hmm. in fact, uh, or it was a barn, it was a place for um, rescuing, uh, saving people. Uh, uh, or safeguarding people and and so on and uh, in the end um, it became maybe a, a, a church as we know it today and then we see that these buildings are even still changing into other functions mm-hmm. and you had mentioned that is, when... I think what we... yeah. right yeah, that is I think what we can learn yeah because you had mentioned a very nice line the last time we spoke, which was keep the materials heavy, but keep ideas light. And I found that very interesting. But just to give a counterpoint, someone would argue saying, you know what, 50 years back, like I live in Bangalore, which is a rapidly changing city. Um, you don't need buildings to be so big or you don't need buildings to have such thick walls. So now you say have hollow cinder block versus brick. I'm just going into one example. So someone would argue it, there is better materials to be sourced 
um, from say, you know, as you mentioned, China, or you have better marble to get from Italy, or uh, I'm just looking at what is around me with the rapidly changing landscape. But you know what? What what kind of saddens me? Um, you know, I'm as I'm not architecturally uh, trained in any way. I don't even have an eye for architecture. But it just feels like every building in every city I've been to is glass, chrome, granite, and it's like you can count off five materials, and it's it just feels like it's air conditioning and you have absolutely no ventilation and it just seems like everywhere you go it's the same cityscape that you're finding um i start with uh, the first uh, statement uh, that you made um mm -hmm. ma materials are heavy and should stay local and people and ids are heavy uh, people and IDs are light right. and uh, should travel. Mm -hmm. uh, that's indeed uh, um, uh, my conviction. Um, and to bring that back to places where we live today is that um, uh, we have to look to what is needed uh, in the place mm -hmm. we are at this moment um, copy pasting architecture uh, that is uh, the same in manhattan uh, or in berlin and we copy paste that to bigger cities in china india and other places uh, maybe uh -huh. we plug in air conditioning in it uh, to survive right. um, yeah, because we we are creating these greenhouses, um, so the the so-called um, uh, architecture that you described from glass and chrome is there because um, it is a kind of uh, standardized, normalized uh, architecture. Um, it has nothing to do with an uh, architecture that is needed at a certain place. It is normed and standardized by uh, uh, the knowledge uh, we acquired in certain environments and that was seen as healthy and good and so on. But as we know, the world is changing as we know that not all the places in the world are the same we should not apply the exact same uh, solutions uh, for completely different uh, places that's what i want to um to say with that uh, we have knowledge uh, we have ideas we have uh, and let's exchange and see what uh, it can can do in the place where you are where i stay um, and how they can be adapted with uh, the resources that are there the material resources but also the human resources um, and your remark on marble um, if you look to natural stone um, it is like uh, very uh, easy uh, to find everywhere interesting stones, uh, natural stones that have a, a high quality. If you use them properly, if you um, uh, finish them in a, in a certain way, you have everywhere uh, super nice uh, materials. You don't have to ship um white uh, uh, carrara uh, marble from italy to the rest of the world yeah and that's such a uh, you know interesting thing because when i was growing up the house we lived in had mosaic tiles and some of the other older houses had red oxide flooring and we could feel a difference in temperature they had more grip so you wouldn't slip as much it would it would last longer and the house i live in now it has marble flooring and i just, just i mean it's, it just feels Oh, it feels nice. It feels premium, but um, I don't think it feels natural to the place we live in. And, and anywhere you go, it's kind of a, more of a status symbol than uh, th than a kind of um, functional aspect of things. And just to add to that, you know, because you said now we have things going around the world. Like now in India, there's a huge presence of IKEA in three, four cities, and it seems to be everyone's getting a Swedish middle furniture into their house which 
is convenient because it's also reasonable. But I, you, know, I, I mean, I'm just interested to find out because it feels like if we approach this this uh, this norm or this standard for thing. We're not going to have any uniqueness in the architectural landscape. We're just going to have one world that looks the same. And everyone's aspiring to buy that flat, which is replicated from, as you mentioned, like a Paris apartment or a Manhattan apartment, which is, I mean, I don't know what what that, what, what I what I make of that, you know? Yeah. Um, I start with the, the marble uh, floor or the floor you described. And uh, um, in fact, yes, uh, if you live in a, in a warmer climate and a stone floor uh, might be very good, uh, mm. but it doesn't have to be marble um, yeah. as such. Uh, it can be a stone floor. Mm. Um, and uh, so there, the choice of the architect is good. The the choice of uh, the material quality. So we should talk about what kind of quality do we want in the space, in order to have a, a comfortable um, environment where we can live in, where we can survive in, where we can shelter, where we can live our lives. Um, mm-hmm. That is uh, super important. Um, and. Uh, then I lost uh, the second part of your um, kind of uh, uh, remark. Um, help me. Uh, right. I lost it. Uh, no, so I, I mean, it wasn't so much a point. Sorry, I was just thinking out loud because um, it, with, with all these uh, standardized stores, right? Like where do it yourself furniture. Yeah, yeah. Um, ah, yeah, yeah. Ikea. Ikea. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So yeah, I was just yeah. trying to think yeah. what, what is your thoughts on uh, a model like that, you know, where it's just. Um, you know, it, it's replicated en masse around the world and you can get like an equivalent of fast fashion where you can pick up the same shirt in Belgium, you can pick up the same shirt in Bangalore because it's just available in these huge warehouses at a cheaper price. Yeah, yeah, I find that really uh, problematic because we are not really paying the real cost of uh, these things and these objects. Mm-hmm. The environmental cost is never calculated in, uh, especially uh, the T-shirt and the IKEA uh, little table you are referring to. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is, uh, um, it's sourced somewhere. It's um, that material is shipped somewhere that uh, is uh, produced, then the table finally, then it goes to central warehouses where it's again distributed. And what is the the, the biggest problem is, in fact, um, that it's so cheap that you say after two or three years, when you don't like it anymore, or when your daughter played with a marker um, and started to uh, make some graffiti on it, Mm -hmm. uh, um, you just say, oh, we throw it away. Uh, We put it on the uh, outside of the house and it's (laughs) um, it's at the garbage. Uh, When uh, especially you were referring to Belgium, um, where I come from, I don't live anymore, but uh, I knew when the moment was there when the students left their uh, student rooms uh, that were completely furnished uh, with um, IKEA. Uh, the, the, a lot of these beds, tables, um, coat hangers were on the street right. and discarded. Uh, they didn't even took them back home or it was like all seen as garbage. So that means that we are paying the environmental cost uh, in the production, in the uh, in the assembly of the product, um, and as society, and then afterwards we also have to take care. Uh, we also have to pay for uh, the the landfill because mm. that are the costs that we we are paying, or for the burning of it. Next to that, uh, you immediately go back to the IKEA because you want to have the new table, uh, (laughs) uh, a cheap one, uh, maybe a different color, and uh, again, the circle starts. Uh, So 
we are in a in a in a circle of consumption uh, where that uh, a, a former cupboard um, went on for generations. So I think uh, true sustainability of a chair and a table and a bed and and these kind of things uh, were handed over from generation to generation, and this is something I think um, uh, we. And that were most of the time also things that could be repaired, that could be uh, adapted, um, and the objects you are referring to that create that uh, interchangeable environment that is quite anonymous, uh, that is not related to any personal, um, even memory. Um, uh, is created now everywhere more and more in the kind of uh, instagram airbnb world where that spaces uh, need to look in a certain way to be accepted to be liked to be um uh, i don't know to be what but uh, <laughs> uh, it's probably yeah, it's creating its own logic uh, and that i find uh, problematic Yes, yeah, no, because we, I remember when, um, you know, we moved houses, my grandfather had these set of office chairs and furniture for the his room, which was rosewood. And I think when he got it, it was already like 100 years old. So I just, I, I made it a point, like, it, for me, I still have those chairs. I mean, it's kept in storage, but I'm like, that for me is how things were built. And and what, what I don't get is, see, you, you obviously come from, um, a place where you're also creating a next generation of designers and architects and people who are going to um, take this forward. But what is um, there for them? Because let me give you an ex example of where we are in India right now is you have this huge market for high-end apartments or just homes, which people are now being uh, in a position. Uh, to, they can afford it. They can furnish it. But Say, for example, you look at a high-end place which costs, say, a million euros or maybe less, maybe more. Now, the architect is hired by the real estate. They're designing these houses. And they, are, of course, you have the celebrity architects who are featured in all the magazines. But the average architect many times doesn't probably know the standard of what a person paying so much wants with uh, maybe exposure, maybe design language. And then you take it down to the person who's a contractor who doesn't really... Um, you know, want to explore with materials because th their margins are at risk. And then you look at the person actually building the house. The labor isn't respected in our country. Like the the the, the, the carpenters, the masons, the, the, yes, the plumbers, yes, yes. they're all respected in Europe. I mean, at least they have a certain uh, level of standing in society. But here it's seen as menial jobs, right? They get paid by the day. They're replaceable. And so they don't really care how they build the house. They don't care whether they're putting in their hard work because they just want to make... The, that money for their family's food that day and and how do you change that because what's the point of putting in so much money into your home when no no one in the process cares about what they're making for you but they only care about the salary or the profits or uh you know finishing that job as quickly as possible mm. um yeah um i i uh I get you, your point. First of all, I don't think uh, this comparison Europe India goes is a bit too uh, too fast. I see that the craftsmen here are also uh, as certainly a certain standard, but by the fact that they are scarce. Okay. Uh, so. Um, you cannot easily, they are fully booked, they are really um, uh, working very hard, uh, there is not, uh, uh, there are not a lot, the, the next generation is not coming, I mean like mm. young people that want to be a carpenter, a mason and so on, that is really tough. Right. So, um, uh, the, 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 the money thing is indeed an issue. Um, uh, one thing is that I find architecture corrupt. Okay. 
because it's working by percentage. Right. Uh, I don't know how that is in India, but uh, they all get a percentage. And mm -hmm. the, the, the fact of the percentage is that um, it's not helping uh, the, the one, the commissioner, the, the client, the, you as a uh, owner, um, you say, okay, 10% uh, is in a group of 5% or 6%. So the archi architects squeeze everything to... Uh, blow up uh, the, the budget uh -huh. okay uh, because uh, the more uh, he can get um, the better and it it tickles down like that and it's not um, helping the project so mm -hmm. what we did in a project uh, here where um, uh, we try to give a lump sum uh, and we give a lump sum to the architects and say, look, we want it. We want to have a first plan. We want to have a second plan. We want to, with, uh, and each time we pay a certain amount. Right. So, so you you have an um, another way of discussing and working together rather than saying, uh, yeah, if the building will cost. Uh, uh, let's say uh, 1,000 uh, and you get 5%. Uh, in the end, he will come with a plan that says, yeah, the building will cost 1,500. I cannot do it for less. Um, right. So you get these kind of very, very strange uh, conversations. Uh, um, uh, to... Um, so the, the, the money is an, uh, a thing that we have to change. Uh, how do we exchange the value around buildings to make right. everybody really a, coll a collaborator rather than a competitor? Another mm -hmm. problem of uh, the building industry is the it's an industry of, uh, um, or let's say, of uh, uh, responsibility. Mm -hmm. The architect says, oh, we need to hire an engineer. An engineer says we need to hire a uh, debt constructor. That constructor says, I only work with this material. Um, so you get, uh, because they all don't want to take the responsibility. Yeah, 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 yeah. P passing on. And passing on so that uh, in the end the manufacturer of the material takes on the um, that his calculations or their calculations are working and so on so you get this kind of very strange um, uh, pushing this responsibility from the table mm -hmm. uh, of their table and that is a bit uh, the circle where we are in and that we have to break. I see, though, in India also an interesting um, example. Um, and maybe I'm, I'm very superficial also in my analysis because I don't know really the in Indian architecture world. Uh, but it could be, uh, uh, Although I think it's in the high-end market, no, it is in the high. I st see an office like Studio Mumbai um, that is doing very interesting things, and it could be a model that might be uh, developed in a different way on a smaller scale. Uh, okay. uh, in in um, it is a very interesting office that works very close with uh, the, the the craftsmen and the people that make things. Uh, so it's really making architecture than um, uh, than the traditional mechanical way, uh, where that somebody is drawing a plan, is putting a plan on somebody's other table and say, "I want exactly this." It's more a dialogue, right. a conversation, where that uh, um, things are done to get the spirit of the project the the, uh, the quality what i was referring to like the floor we are not talking about a, um, a wall or a floor uh, um, uh, that has uh, a certain cost only but also one that has a certain uh, quality in itself what is it doing to our bodies? What is it? Uh, how is it um, helping us uh, to live there? And that I think is uh, important. Yeah, that I think is so nice to hear that it's um, 
you know that that these kind of outfits exist because that at least gives two things right it gives um a sense of okay there's an opportunity for a potential homeowner saying okay these these avenues are there to explore as opposed to just going to the 10 or 20 biggest um real estate companies who are building homes and villas and condiments uh, sorry condominium condiments no condominiums and saying you know what i mm. can go to a more niche thing i okay might involve a little bit more money but i'd rather save up for another 5 years uh, rather than just buying because it's very sad when you hear of these uh, you hear a lot of ads right for these apartments on radio or television where you buy this and only so much and, and and a lot of people put their entire life savings into buying a home whether it's a villa whether it's an apartment and you know just give you an example like last year there was this uh, we had like un un um you know um you know uh, um, rains that were really sort of unparalleled when it comes to bangalore and almost for 8 months it rained and then you have these people who lived in this high end villa community and what they didn't realize is that the people who built the villa and layout hadn't really planned it or rather they had hidden the fact that it was built on a storm drain and next thing you know like after 5 or 10 days of continuous rain the entire place was flooded and these are like homes which cost maybe 5 million dollars were their cars were submerged their entire living rooms were submerged in water and it's this is not this is not just people trying to get more profits but it's outright cheating people and that's very sad to see wow. right from and was, yeah yeah mm. yeah um i think uh, i give another example this is horrible what you tell now but uh, yeah i'm afraid it's uh, um so so we they also see we lost contact with nature with the mm. environment we are not analyzing uh, any more um even the position of the house toward the north or the south or the this or the that or the rain is coming from there mm. the, um so we are not uh, analyzing this environment anymore we are completely disconnected uh, from it yeah um what what i wanted to say is uh, i wanted to give another example that maybe uh, can help people to um to grow in an uh, in a different way than because they also think everything needs to happen now you need to mm-hmm. have the house the kitchen the bathroom the bedrooms to this to that 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 all all needs to be there yeah first of all uh and, and the example that i want to give is uh, of an uh, of uh, a chilean uh, chilean architects um elemental um uh, a project they made you know, like uh, i think now 10 15 years ago uh, i don't know exactly but it's very simple it's a social housing complex um and it has an uh, concrete blocks concrete blocks of a certain size i don't dare to say how many square meters mm. but quite small and has two levels um and it has a door it has uh, um uh the infrastructure for water and the infrastructure for electricity right. so that means you can do a bathroom a kitchen in it and uh, and then next to that you have a kind of open space where you can that you can fill it in yourself because maybe you want to make a shop Mm. So um it's a bit like yeah, lego. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it is like that. It's um but somebody else wants uh, has uh, four children. Um and somebody else uh, wants to live there with uh, his or her parents. Um so you get uh, other uh, configurations. Um mm. and everybody is able so you have a, a very strong good uh, solid uh, structure and mm. you just built against it with very light materials um that you built yourself um and you do over time when you have the means but you have nice. the, the basic infrastructure so you have very good water you have very good uh, you have a bathroom you have the all the um, the essentials are there uh and uh, from there you can start the rest 
you see yourself because it's also not what the real estate uh, developer or the um, the housing company is saying you need to have. Um, yeah. So you have uh, space to adapt. Um, and adaptation is, by the way, the most sustainable way to deal with architecture. Because if you see and you think your daughter is now, um, she is 15 months, I understood uh, mm -hmm. before. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, in 10 years, um, she has different needs as today. Yeah, in 15 yeah. years, uh, or maybe 20 years, she will live in your house. Uh, mm -hmm. um, or maybe earlier. Uh, and so you go to, we think, for, uh, for this moment, or I will use the... The, uh, the sentence of Stuart Brand, uh, Brand um, which is an architect, British architect, who inspires me a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. And he made the sentence, um, uh, um, buildings are, every building is a prediction and every prediction is wrong. <laughs> nice. So, um, with have, having said that this, yeah, you you can have now a family, but maybe I uh, I don't know. But uh, tomorrow your wife comes into you and says, "No, you have to know something. We, I'm expecting a, a twin." You don't know. Yeah. You um, you don't know how things will evolve. Uh, mm -hmm. So that is great about life, but that is also if you think you can plan everything uh, in the house and architecture, you're wrong. Um, so yeah. make it adaptable um, and make it in such a way that uh, things can change. Yeah. And you know that's coming that's such a that's such a valid point you make because I see uh, people and I'm talking about people close to me who built all these big bungalows and that was the idea and the dream sold to them right in that generation and even today they said you have to buy this house it has to be of a certain price of a certain material it has been a certain layout uh, in a certain neighborhood and um it has to be this many floors you see people i see people around me like now building these huge in a small property like a 60 by 50 square foot like a 3000 square foot property they're building up to 10000 square feet they're going higher and higher and what i'm noticing is as you get older Many of them aren't able to even go to the second floor because they have bad knees, they have a bad back, they're in a wheelchair, they're too old. And then they sell that house and move to a flat, which is all on one level. I'm like, this is interesting. And as we are going into a country now where a lot more people are getting older, you, you see a lot of people getting exploited because then they get help, they get maids, they get nurses. And then those nurses know that these people are helpless without them. And then they take them for granted. They steal from them. In many cases, they murder them. And um, it's something as basic as not being independent anymore and not being able to do things in your home opens you up to so much exploitation from outside, which is comes down to it. It's the building layout in many ways, right? Yes, correct. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, you almost could say it's a, uh, a business, it became a business model. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's like uh, programmed in the in in the building itself that you have to uh, sell it at a certain moment because you cannot use it anymore. Because um, um, yeah, I I think you point to the the real problem uh, of today. Uh, where we are and uh, um, so there I think we need governments, cities uh, that help to plan this um, and that help us to um, uh, get deal more freely with the norms and the standards mm -hmm. that uh, organize different contracts um, with the architects and the contractors to share the, the responsibility together to mm -hmm. make buildings that are adaptable, um, that uh, adapt to life rather than to a financial market. Uh, and yet yeah, this is what, uh, what we 
uh, how things should be regulated uh, differently. Right. You, you know, uh, Jan, there's a thing which we keep hearing in conversations now because it's the hip thing to do, right? When we hear, especially in certain circles, uh, we hear of uh, people dropping these words like eco-friendly architecture, sustainable architecture, accessible ac architecture. And yes, while there is a rea realistic need for it, a lot of times it's just said in, you know, at art galleries or it's said in, in coffee shops where people are just, they want to appear like they know everything, you know? But mm. you clearly have done a lot of um, thinking and you put a lot of time into researching how to use sustainable materials or renewable materials or salvaging old um, materials in your projects. And, you know, from everything from a railway station, I think you designed or um, uh, you to, to, to the other property, which I read about in The Guardian, which was, in, I think, somewhere in France, you really have put materials to use as opposed to just saying you know what it's 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 an eco-friendly building i put rainwater harvesting but i've just poured concrete into every space possible you haven't done that you've done actual um work with different kinds of materials so what is your 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 mindset and your approach to say accessible buildings or to eco-friendly and sustainable buildings but uh accessible for me the um, um, the definition would be that uh, the material and the technology that you use to for instance isolate or to uh, to make certain things of the building itself are um, uh, are on such a level that you could do it yourself mm -hmm. um, it will maybe take more time to do it mm -hmm. uh, when you have to do it yourself but uh, you you don't need a specialist uh, i think that is uh, for me the um the the the, uh, the definition of accessibility mm -hmm. the problem with many of the, the materials and technologies today is around houses is that you are not allowed anymore to do it uh, because they are too complex and too um, designed in such a way that you are uh, you have to pay. That's the only thing what you have to do. Mm -hmm. But you don't understand them anymore. Right. Uh, so that, that that is a kind of problem in itself for many people to deal with. Uh, um, so we got also disconnected from the systems um, around us um, that are surrounding us. Uh, Eco-friendly, um, I also, we also use concrete in the building itself that we built. We made a building indeed, uh, uh, 2000 square meters, 20 materials we developed for that uh, building. Mm. Um, and uh, but also we also used traditional concrete there is nothing wrong with that if yeah. you use it in a, in a way uh, that not the whole building is uh, fully uh, a concrete building if there was already a stone building if uh, you only used it on the places where you really need it um, right. in order to support the building uh, and you make sure that the concrete is well produced uh, you can you can have concrete that is uh, environmentally um, produced. Right, yeah? right. Most of the time today, concrete is not produced in a, in, a, in a good way. And that's why there is a lot of protest against it. But we should not be against concrete. We should be against the wrong use. And mm. we should be against the wrong production. Um, Everybody is focusing so much on wood uh, today. Um, I really would advise not to use wood uh, in such quantities. Uh, there are towers that are built, uh, flat uh, buildings in wood. I think it's mm. really wrong. Um, right. Because we are cutting trees uh, in a speed we have never seen before. Mm. And we think we are building and finally environmental friendly. <laughs> uh, so there are 
it's better to do one in concrete with good concrete uh, than with uh, and to do that in a CO2 uh, low uh, impact uh, right. um, way of production and uh, leave the forest there. Right. So that it uh, can consume uh, CO2. Mm. It takes 30, 40 years before there is a new uh, forest that uh, has the same uh, impact on uh, global warming. Yeah. Yeah, and that house you built probably uh, wouldn't so last that long with wood. friendly building. Uh, oh, uh, wood is a very good building material. Yeah, right. it's a very good. I, I don't say it's. Uh, no, I mean with now the no, forest really fires do. and you see the wildfires in across the world. Ah. <laughs> Just yeah. Uh, um, yes, that, that is of course. Uh, but uh, wood is a very good uh, material yeah. against fire. It, it takes um, a long. If you have um, a steel building, uh, will collapse like uh, a pudding, uh, mm. and uh, steel becomes elastic. Right, but right. Uh, wo wood um takes uh goes burn slowly to the core of the, the wood and breaks then um, okay, okay. so you can survive longer in a wooden building than in a steel building oh okay that's yeah uh, that's a myth that i yeah i didn't know i thought it's like oh just you know yeah. matchstick building but clearly yeah no 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 right no, no, no. no because uh, um, go on please yeah yeah, uh, what I want to say is that, that uh, using 20 different uh, uh, materials from the region creates a kind of local ecosystem, an eco uh, uh, system between makers, producers, landscape, nature. And uh, it's not just one material, it's many materials and many ways of production. So you need a diversity. Uh, right. in that environment not just uh, one type of tree or one type of plant or one type of soil because then that monoculture created the problem we are in so we need many things in order to have a healthy environment um, and therefore i really believe in bioregions um, mm -hmm. and that's uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, where we i'm working towards is bioregional design practices, hmm. um, which uh, I think is uh, the future. Uh, and that's when things start to fall in place in um, building at a certain place that you build differently in Manhattan than you built in Bangalore or hmm. in the north of Italy where I am now. So hmm. you do that because you look around, you find that things, you connect it by design, you test it, you prototype it, and then you build um, an object, a product, and uh, whatever, in order to to see uh, um, uh, what kind of uh, environment you not only for yourself but also for the, the bigger region you built with it. It's accessible in the sense that um, the materials don't have to come from the other side of the world. So yeah. you can source it locally. Uh, so you and me, we could do it. We could get it. Um, uh, we have to make sure that these things don't get uh, fully monopolized and privatized uh, as such. Um, uh, standards probably needs to be, uh, because standards have also uh, a reason they are there for security or uh, um, other uh, uh, things. They have to be probably adapted locally. Mm. Um, also, that should be done anyway, because at certain places you have a lot of uh, potential earthquakes or this or um, people uh, or like you said before water and uh, and so you have to adapt anyway to the the local context uh, and the the, the layer you decide you're building on mm -hmm. and with that uh, you create a kind of vernacular uh, architecture that is very specific for um, 
the, the region where you live. Uh, and that will create a, a world that is much more diverse, much more richer and complex than an IKEA world that is everywhere the same. Um, and is copy pasted uh, and is creating greenhouses uh, in Africa and India and uh, that were originally European buildings. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, they are not adapted to the to the environment. Yeah, because it's 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 so sad to see um, the potential of design being limited, right? Because you have so many great ideas, but they're being put aside for profit. And homes are no longer homes where you can enjoy being with your family, but it's more of a status symbol of showing off to the outside world how much you've made, how successful you are, how big the home is, where the home is, how many homes you have. And that's, and that's, at, you know, at the end of the day, it's not something you come back home to. It's, you, you have it uh, out there uh, being thrown around, as you said, on Instagram or in parties or in school or college reunions or in work get together saying, oh, you have a home. I have a flat in London. I have a flat in Manhattan. I have four flats and thing. I have a country home. But you're not <laughs> able to enjoy even one of them because, as you said, because many of these are speciality buildings, you're not able to change a light fixture because you need to call the service guy who's come from there. You can't change the toilet seat because you have to get someone from here. You have to, you know, it's become such a hard thing to maintain. And I want to understand what your idea for the future is because you mentioned something really nice when we spoke before recording about how in a home, within a home, not just multiple homes, within a home, you can have different rooms and different spaces doing different things for different senses. So not every room has to be only for the eyes, but you can have rooms that have different textures, different smells, different um, mm. uh, things. So you had mentioned that briefly. Uh, I, I don't know if I misunderstood that, but if, if you could elaborate on what you meant by the design for uh, heightening each sense and for relaxing each sense and for a room to work, a room to sleep in, a room to enjoy. So you, you'd briefly spoken about that. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I think um, we are, as uh, like I said before, every building is a prediction and every building, uh, every prediction is wrong. Um, we should uh, think um, differently. Um, uh, if you say like if you start starting from a kind of program like these are bedrooms and these are uh, uh, living spaces and this is uh, pa -pa -pa. so maybe you better start from the idea I would like to have a, a an environment where I can where it is silent um, and then you would like uh, to have an, uh, an environment, a space uh, where you uh, things can become wet and uh, um, and maybe you want to have a space where uh, uh, you want to have a lot of light, uh, daylight, uh, uh, and you want some spaces that are good in the winter and you want some that are better in the summer. Mm. Uh, so you you start thinking about a certain level of comfort um, and then uh, the next step is that you start thinking oh yeah that could be a bedroom ah yeah um, that room we could use in the in the winter uh, and we put a stove there um, because it's colder and it's smaller, but we still can go all together in that room. And that's next to the kitchen, uh, because there it w can be go wet or it's the bathroom and so on. So you start organizing the house from uh, a quality uh, rather than a, a prefixed uh, program. Mm. And afterwards, these spaces uh, can change. This can become an office uh, or uh, an office where you can work uh, in a silent corner. Uh, you also have a little kitchen. You have a place that uh, could function also in the winter, uh, but it's not so defined as living room, bedroom, um, and so on. It's more about the qualities in itself. 
Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that creates like buildings that are uh, able to adapt to our needs, mm -hmm. uh, to our, um, yeah. Yeah. No, I've just been, I'm, I'm just trying to internalize that because it's quite, quite cool, right? That you have a place that is dark where you can, you know, be silent with your thoughts. Then you have a place which is bright where you can be productive and you can be social. And it, it's quite nice because you're playing to your moods and it, it doesn't feel like most places you've been to, uh, homes nowadays. It's what you try to do is if a room is dark, you kind of brighten it up with putting LEDs and halogens and spotlights and um, yeah, but if you let the house uh, be determined by the layout of moods and emotions, then every part of the house has something for you, right? You don't have to escape from it to kind of get that feeling because a lot of people are like, oh, I want to escape my home and go on holiday. But if your home can provide all emotions for you because of the thought you put into it, then it kind of creates an experience um, for all aspects of your life. Exactly. It's a bit uh, to go away from the, the engineered spaces. You see that often in office spaces like big banks or whatever, they have like everywhere 500 looks on the desk. So everywhere exactly the same uh, mood. But you know, and I know that if we work, uh, you have different settings. Um, you have, uh, indeed, you need sometimes uh, to be very concentrated in front of your laptop or your computer, but then you have a meeting, then um, uh, you need to do an, uh, a call uh, um, uh, where you have to raise your voice. So you have all these kind of different uh, circumstances, but the people that are working there, they just get one uh, kind of quality, one kind of light, one kind of air even, um, that is fully conditioned uh, and they get become sick in that environment because they need many different um, uh, situations uh, to to do their job properly. It's that same practice of, you know, there's an office tech park which looks like this in San Francisco. We'll replicate the same thing. There's this office that uses an off open plan. We'll all use an open plan. And it takes away, it takes away the unique needs of an individual. Um, but more importantly, it also is a bit disheartening for the designer, for the architect who's now training. And you importantly, you mentioned that there are a lot of people now not willing to take up this trade of whether of artisanal trades, right? Whether it's masons or carpenters or plumbers or these things which are essentially uh, the the guts and of the building. So, just your parting words is: if there's someone who's aspiring to be an architect, what would you say to him or her? Um, to, to, to keep them focused and keep them excited about the, the, the choice they've made? Oh, uh, to become architects or... To, to become architects, to go to get down, to go in this path of designing homes and not be disheartened by this mass production of homes by big companies, uh, by big corporates. So someone wants to be uh, inspired very by... Simple, mm -hmm. Very simple, try to listen to your own body, try to listen to your own experiences, um, uh, uh, be true to them uh, and uh, be sure that everyone has the same universal uh, needs uh, that are seem very individual, uh, but are in fact uh, very um, uh, common and don't erase them, don't diminish them, but embrace them. Lovely. Jan, it's been a pleasure uh, speaking with you. Um, I really appreciate you taking me through a lot of the processes and a lot of the challenges and a lot of the things that we are living in and the things that we can potentially do to en enhance our experience and enhance the way we live our lives with our, the people we love and the people we want to be with. So I um, thank you for joining me today and good luck with all your projects and um, congratulations on all the great work you've done. 
Thank you for the conversation and uh, looking forward to continue.